my kako and welcome to Ukulele Songs of Hawaii. I'm your host, Walter Kawaiia, and joining me today is Dr. Tiffany Lani Ng, Professor of English at Kapi'olani Community College. Aloha, Dr. Ng. Aloha. Nice to have you. Gosh, you're all in your royal colors, your Thank red you. and your, your poor Kenny Kenny Lei. Thank you. Thank you for the lay. Thank you for having me today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, let me just tell our viewing audience why uh, we have Tiffany uh, Ng, who is a lecturer at uh, Kapilani Community College. Uh, she's uh, written a book. And if I get the story right, uh, this was part of her dissertation. Yes. Uh, I believe you have your doctorate in, in English, is I that do. correct? Yeah. And so I guess that was her work. And she chose for her work a very interesting subject, one that is beloved. Uh, particularly in the Hulu world uh, and in the Hawaiian, uh, the Hawaiian community at large. We're talking about uh, the book that was written, and it's entitled Reclaiming Kalakaua. And so I'm going to ask Tiffany, what, um, what is Reclaiming Kalakaua? Just by the title alone, what is that all about? It's uh, um, re, uh, bringing to the surface the more complete or nuanced story of David Kalakaua, the seventh Mo'i of Hawaii after Kamehameha the Great, um, using Hawaiian language and English language newspapers and books, travel logs, periodicals, journals from the 19th century, written or, and published during his reign, um, to tell us a more complete or nuanced story of his character. And so the stories that we've heard about him as the Merry Monarch, mm -hmm. or um, one who enjoyed parties and um, entertainment, you know, that's one side of the story. But I'm presenting in Reclaiming Kalakaua a more complete or a, a more, um, I guess, a more versus a, like the black and white picture that we already have of him, mm -hmm. a color picture. Okay, I right. get it. Um, so you're bringing to light, and basically to a new audience, um, <clears throat> you know, your generation, my generation, and then, you know, your children's generation. Um, this is going to give them an opportunity to have a different narrative, a different perspective uh, from what traditionally we've seen by the authors of the 19th and 20th century authors. That's yeah, right. That's right. Um, I found it interesting. Okay, I have to confess. I mean, I just got her book, um, and there's going to be a book launch. We should mention that right now. This Friday, this is the official book launch. Yes. I mean, the books are available at uh, your favorite bookstore, right? Uh, Barnes and Noble. I should have mentioned it, but at your favorite bookstores. But the official book launch is this Friday. From five to seven, it's open to the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's free, it's free. and it's at Vivai Collective, Collective right there, uh, 1100 uh, University, University Avenue. Avenue. Mm -hmm. So, where exactly is that? So, I'm unfamiliar with that. Place. For those of us who um, are a little uh, more uh, wise and mature, that would be the old uh, Varsity Building. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yes, that circular building uh, on University Avenue in okay. Moiliili. Okay. Right. All right. Um, ample parking in the ample back parking. on the back side. Right, right, okay, right. From five to seven. Yeah, there'll be Hawaiian music and um, Hawaiian food and lomi lomi. Really? So, yeah. So do come out. Okay. Yeah. All right. To all my friends out there <laughs> who are in dire need of lomi lomi, um, come out. And I'm going to assume that the book will be available. The for, book will be for available, purchase. right, for purchase, and and I'll be signing books too. So excellent. Come and get your copy. And the books come in. Uh, this is the paperback. And, um, and, and, and the hardcover, hard yes, the hard yes. Cover one, yeah. um, I found this, so I, I just wanted to start by, um, and thank you for sharing all that information, by thank the you. way. Thank you, thank you. What I thought was interesting um, is how, and I've only gotten through the 16 pages of the introduction. It's fine. Um, and I've had to read, read it twice, because there's a lot, um, Tiffany, you don't mind I call you Tiffany? Please, please do. So Tiffany goes through in her introduction to really explain in depth what this whole book is about and the narrative. And so I want to, I found this very interesting that uh, she chose to start off by using the Hawaiian term ho'ailona. And for those of us in the Hawaiian community, we're very familiar with the term ho'ailona. It means sign or symbol or something to represent something. And um, she identifies three 
And the first two have to do specifically to Kalakaua mm -hmm. and maybe validating his ascent yes. to the throne. Exactly. Am I correct? Exactly. And so the first, uh, we thought we're not going to read it. So, uh, you know, uncle's not going to be reading his stories from the book today. Um, but the first uh, Hoailona you identify uh, to validate his ascent to the throne is Akua, his connection to the gods. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, explain why that is significant in, in Hawaiian. Right. You know, when Kalakaua ascended the throne, he was the first Mo'i who wasn't Kamehameha. And that's important because during the 19th century and, and before that, our Kanaka Maoli people, they, uh, they thought of uh, a, a Mo'i or a Kanaka's right to the throne depended on genealogy. And Kalakaua, being a non Kamehameha, needed to prove himself in a sense. Um, he, he was of uh, Ali'i Nui descent, you know, both of his parents, um, uh, Kapa'akea and, and Keoho. Kalole were of Ali'i Nui status, but he had a lot to prove. And the Ho'ailona of um, the rainbow mm. and um, these different um, the fish and all of the Ho'ailona that I mentioned in the introduction were signs confirming his right to the throne by Akua. And the Ali'i Nui were thought of by our Kanaka Maoli um, Kupuna as part Akua very, very close in lineage to the God. And so having that confirmation from the Akua confirmed his right to be sovereign, to be, to be a Mo'i after the Kamehameha line. That was so important. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, for the views out there that may not be familiar with the, the monarchy and, and the, you know, the, the, the ascent of that. So what Tiffany is referring to is the, the Kamehameha dynasty, which, mm -hmm. you know, follows after the unification of the Hawaiian Islands in 1819 by Kamehameha I, Kamehameha the Great, by Ea, and then his, his two sons, the second and the third. That's right. And then you had the fourth and the fifth. His grandsons. His grandsons. And <clears throat> so for those that are not familiar, why did the Kamehameha dynasty not continue? Because there were Kamehamehas out there. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Princess Ruth, Keilikulani Nui. Right. I mean, you know, Kamehameha the fifth had no... He had no posterity. Uh, he wasn't married. Mm -hmm. um, so he, you know, there was no one to take his place so the dynasty could continue. Right. But there were other Kamehamehas. Right. And I mentioned Ke'ili Koloni specifically because she, she, was, she was powerful. Yes. Uh, she, um, she had a lot of land. I mean, uh, amongst all of those Ali that were living at the time, right. she was the most property rich of them all. Right, and that's how um, we, we get the uh, Bishop Estate Correct. or Kamehameha Schools and all of that property from Powahi. I mean, she received that right, right. from Ke'eli Kolani. And Powahi was another, you know, um, candidate for the throne too. So yeah. she, had, she loved somebody else, huh? She <laughs> Even though the fifth proposed, but, you know. Right, yeah. right. So she married Charles Reed Bishop, right. and, um, and so Luna Lilo took the throne after La Kapuaiva. And then after Luna Lilo passed, and then Kalakaua. So was Luna Lilo the first elected? He was the first elected. In the first ever um, yeah, uh, election in the Hawaiian kingdom, he won out, um, and he uh, was on the, the throne less than a year before he succumbed to, to illness. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a while uh, since I, you know, I was in pursuit of Hawaiian studies. Um, it seemed as though the young Kalakawa uh, befriended, and, uh, you know, this is neither good or bad, but mm -hmm. be, was befriended by many of the, the, the white businessmen in the community huh? at the time. Mm -hmm. And after reading just your introduction mm -hmm. and with what little knowledge I have, mm -hmm. Uh, it appears, it, it's apparent that they had some ulterior motive in mind in they befriending Kalakaua. They did. Because it all comes to fruition right. in their favor right. in the end with the overthrow. Right. Am I correct? Yes. And, you know, it's important to, to also make the statement that they befriended Luna Lilo too. And they were a large part of his cabinet when he became Mo'i. Um, and... You know, Kalakaua was known to have wavered quite a bit. Before his election, he was um, against uh, the seeding of Pearl Harbor or Pearl River. Yeah. Um, 
You know, and then just before he uh, was elected to the throne, he decided to support that. You know, um, but there was, a, or at least supposedly, but he, he will claim, you know, and in my, many of his records, that he never wanted to give up Pearl Harbor, you know, to the U.S. as part of the reciprocity treaty. But um, he did. He did, um, you know, have that American support, as did Luna Lilo, and he um, allowed them to be part of his as did Luna Lilo. So I don't know if it was so much of a break uh -huh. from, you know, what the Mo'i, the previous to him, were, were actually doing. Now, am I correct in my understanding that in, so after Luna Lilo, uh, you know, passed away, mm -hmm. there was another election. And am I correct in stating that amongst the Hawaiian community, mm -hmm. at least, the more favorite uh, uh, individual was, uh, was Emma? Ah, this is so interesting that you would bring this up because um, there was a small but very powerful and very uh, loud, you know, um, uh, co community of, um, for example, backed by Joseph Nabahi. You know, oh, yes, backed yes, by yes. George Washington Pilipo, and they were Akamai, very active uh, patriots, you know, in the in the um, Native Hawaiian political circle, um, and they favored Emma. They did. And um, on the day that, <laughs> that the representatives elected Kalakaua as the new king, there was a riot at the courthouse. And her supporters were said to have been uh, very boisterous and very uh, loud about um, their disappointment with this new announcement. And so they rioted at the courthouse. And um, furniture was broken, and the courthouse was uh, said oh. to be destroyed. And oh. yeah. But. Um, so when they, when they say in, in the history books um, that Emma was the more popular than Kalakaua, mm -hmm. is that true? And when they say more popular, was that amongst the Hawaiian community? I want to say that from the newspaper articles that I've researched and the different letters, that this was a small um, was part a small. of the Hawaiian community. I see. They were loud and they were active. <laughs> and, and I think we, we can understand that a little bit better today. Yeah, how that kind of voice and that activity can can you know can play a part in getting your um, your I guess agenda heard. I mean, I want to think that um, for the Makaainana um, election must have been a new thing, wasn't it? Yes. So was that uh, was that? And maybe this is unfair of me to ask this question or to even pose it. But was that another ploy on the part of you know? The businessmen in the community, knowing, I mean, it's just, it's just like the great Mahele, you know. I mean, yeah, the land was not made available for mm -hmm. purchase by anybody that had the means, mm -hmm. but those people that created that Mahele knew very well that the Hawaiians themselves would not have the financial means, at least the majority of that, the Makainana, to purchase land. Henceforth, you know, that plan went through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, could this be, but in the political arena, um, you know, to further their candidate, so to speak, Kalakaua, uh, because um, perhaps they had him where, you know, they wanted him, mm -hmm. um, and that smaller group within the Hawaiian community, mm -hmm. so the larger group in the Hawaiian community, henceforth, I'm going to assume, were in favor of Kalakaua, perhaps, because they were paying attention to what was being purported uh -huh. by the white business community. Right. The, I mean, it, it could <clears throat> be so, but in the Hawaiian language newspapers during that time, um, I, I found that um, majority of the population, of the Makainana population, supported Kalakaua. Um, you know, there, again, there was that small you know, group that supported Queen Emma, but they were loud and they were active and um, they were angry too at, you know, at, you know, at Kalakaua's victory. Um, but the election was exciting. It was an exciting time for Makainana too because they could get their voices heard. And they came out. They came out in numbers to, um, to vote because there was um, a, a kingdom-wide plebiscite before that. Um, and they came out in numbers. There was a report of 100 um, Makainana from Laie mm. who came all the way into Honolulu to vote. You know, and, and so they're, they're making their voices heard. And I also want to say that um, the election is an exciting opportunity to understand the complexity mm -hmm. of Kanaka Maoli. 
political the political climate, you know, and that they enjoyed voting. They saw it as a privilege. And I think that's a lesson that we can learn from sure. today. Um, and they, they valued um, the hands that would lead the Hawaiian kingdom. You know, they, that was important to them. And um, I think a lot of those who did support Emma um, supported Kalakaua after the election for the sake of the, uh, the purpose of the continuance of the uh, uh, Hawaiian kingdom. You know, so that sure. they, they didn't support Kalakaua in the beginning, but then after that... They got behind him as Kanaka Maui. Because they had to. To support, because they had to. They had to. And, it, and that was a good thing. And that was a good thing. I will talk more when we come back from our break with Dr. Tiffany Ng about why that was a good thing. I'm your host, Walter Kabaya. We're here on Ukulele Songs of Hawaii talking to Dr. Tiffany Ng about her new book, Reclaiming Kalakaua. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to join us on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock for Cannabis Chronicles, the 10,000-year odyssey, where we take a look at cannabis as food, cannabis as medicine, cannabis and religion, and cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam. So please join us to learn all about Canada. Again, Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm your host, Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you, and uh, aloha. We're back here at Ukulele Songs of Hawaii. I'm your host, Walter Kavaya, and today we're talking with our special guest, Dr. Tiffany Lani Ng and her new book, Reclaiming Kalakaua. So just before the break, we were in getting into uh, going down rabbit holes, as I like to call it. So uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, is it true that more people outside of Hawaii like to David Kalakaua than those within his own kingdom? No. Um, and that's the supposed belief. When um, Kalakaua ascended the throne, he made several trips outside of Hawaii. In, in 1874, Four and five, he went to Washington, D.C. to uh, speak to Congress on behalf of the reciprocity treaty. And the U.S. loved him. They loved him wherever he went. They greeted him at train stations and um, down the street at Washington, um, in Washington, D.C., at the White House. And Ulysses S. Grant, who was president then, he um, welcomed Kalakaua with the first ever official White House dinner given to any, any sovereign, any leader. And um, on his way back, they loved Kalakaua. They greeted him and they welcomed him with pomp and circumstance, with royal bands and uh, state and, and city officials came out. Um, and when he returned home, they also welcomed him with parades, and bonfires and fireworks. And, um, and it was a, just a beautiful welcome, beautiful tribute. Um, when he made his way around the world in 1881, right. becoming the first sovereign to do so, the people all over um, Asia, Europe, and the U.S. again loved him. And they honored him as the king of Hawaii. And um, when he came home, the people welcomed him again with the same kinds of um, parades and processions and tributes and, and arches, even made of flowers and signs wow. and plants. And it was beautiful. And, the people in Hawaii were able to follow the king on each of these travels. The Hawaiian language newspapers and the English language newspapers printed in Hawaii um, reported on all of these stops that he made. And it helped in 1881, the people in Hawaii were suffering from the smallpox mm -hmm. epidemic. There was a large outbreak. And the queen, uh, who was regent at the time, Lili'o Kalani, she um, took her brother's place while he was away, 
and she had to deal with it. And it was heavy on her shoulders, and it was heavy on the king's shoulders too, as he was away. But while the people were dealing with the smallpox epidemic and seeing loved ones you know, succumb to that, the reports of the trip you know, were able to boost their spirits and really make them feel um, proud, proud of their king and proud of themselves and proud of their home. And I think that they loved him even more. And where there might have been wavering between he and Emma, I think that he was able to garner more, uh-huh. more support. You know, for his campaign and what he wanted to do. I mean, sure. I mean, when you think about it in today's political scene, you know, within America and Hawaii, I mean, not much has changed. I mean, I guess it goes back. We're, we're human beings, mm-hmm. and so just by our very nature, we all have differences of opinion. We and we express ourselves. We express our views and our opinions. Some are louder than others. Right. And so. The Hawaiians were no different than the Hawaiians of today, than the community that we live in today, right. of Hawaiians. Um, you know, just switching gears for a second, I know he's well-loved in the, the Hula community mm-hmm. because of his resurgence. So just so that we get the record straight, that, you know, when the missionaries first came here mm-hmm. and they saw the Hawaiians in their dancing, mm-hmm. they classified that as as paganistic, very heathen, right. and so it became, it just got forced, slowly got forced underground, right. not to be performed publicly. Right. And Kalakaua made that one of his, uh, one of his things, and you indicate that, and I'm trying to find it in your introduction here, where Kalakaua makes it a point, uh, and I just, I just want to read what was, here it is, um, if I could read this for a second, the Moe's encouragement of Hula's public performance throughout his reign was a direct, defiant reply to missionary-based newspaper opposition, even in the Hawaiian language, to any claim the past and present could combine to nurture and increase Hawaiian nationalism. So there's a lot that is in that sentence, or that Mm -hmm. statement. Um, So, I mean, in as much as Kalakaua wanted to let his Hawaiian people know, no, it's fine to dance and don't feel that don't listen to them and what they have defined the hula as dance. Right. And so at his coronation, it was a gala affair of dancing. Every halal from every community came out and performed oike and to show their love and aloha for the king. Right. right. And it went on for weeks, day <laughs> and night. And, you know, and, and part of it, Dr. Noi Noi Silva tells us that part of the reason for the ban was because hula prevented the Hawaiians from, according to missionaries, working. They couldn't work during the day, you know, and that was, you know, in, according to missionaries, that was the ideal. And, and so Halakoa having the hula performed night and day, you know, <laughs> for hours and, and, and on the palace lawn, you know, in such a public arena, you know, I mean, so that was during his coronation and then during his jubilee. It, again, it went on for weeks, day and night. I mean, and there was also the creation of new mele, you know, and again, I mean, very defiant, very exciting, you know. And I love that he used his position as Mo'i to do this, sure. you know, to take that agency and to say that this is what I'm doing, this is my idea, and I have control, I have the authority to do this. Well, and, and decisions on his part to do that just, you know, endeared the Hawaiian people even more to him. Because it did. Of that. And it's gone on for centuries. It did. You know, and, and the hula during that time, we should understand too that it was performed, you know, even against this ban, um, you know, in pockets here and there, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, at, um, at parties and you know, banquets and here and there, but not in such a public, public display way, as yeah. Kalakoa had it done. Um, and also, you know, in the face of the, we talked about population decimation in the, in the smallpox epidemic and all of these diseases that were taking the lives of the Nakamaoli in the celebration. The mm-hmm. celebration of who we are and the thought that we are continuing to grow or that we, we can grow as a people. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's beautiful. You know, and beautiful. that's hopeful. And I think that's what the people needed then. Yeah. Um, so I want to get back to the, in, this portion in the introduction of your book where you distinctly identify three distinctive periods. Um, the first period you talk about is, <clears throat> it, was a ser- it serves as a detailed review of this historical and critical literature 
the misrepresentation or distortions are examined within three time periods. The first being the attacks written during his reign, from 74 to 91. The second, uh, assessments produced between the tumultuous years of 91 to 1900. And then the third period is all of the historical accounts of the Mo'i published between 1900 and present. Mm -hmm. So I guess you're talking about publications that came out in that third period, mm -hmm. um, giving their point of view. So, you know, we're running out of time, but what I'd like you to do in the remaining minute or so that we have, Dr. Ng, is capitalize what this dissertation, what this book, Reclaiming Kalakaua, from this point, because it, it's obvious that there were three English newspapers that were written, mm -hmm. and there was two Hawaiian newspapers that were written. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess for, for most of us, we always got the perspective of the English written newspaper mm -hmm. as the, the absolute fact and true mm -hmm. about Kalakaua. But in your studies of all of this combined, and his personal letters, as he traveled around the world, um, you came to discover something much different than what was perpetrated. Am I correct? Yes. Well, the, the Hawaiian language newspapers represent this really special, rich archive of Hawaiian history. And um, this is what most of the information uh, about Kalakaua is, is taken from. And if you want to know um, anything about the king, anything new about the king, you've got to tap into this rich resource. And so the Hawaiian language newspapers show us that during his period, the native people loved him. And the people outside of Hawaii loved him. There are people who, who didn't support him, but they ended up um, supporting him for the sake of the Hawaiian kingdom. Um, and, and afterward, after his death in 1891, people were trying to overtake his kingdom. And so there's another uh, narrative there, and you can find out more about that in the book. <laughs> I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to cut Dr. Tiffany uh, Ng off. We've completely run out of time. I want to say mahalo nui. And if you want to hear the rest of that discussion, Friday, 5 to 7, uh, Bye Bye Collective on University Avenue, Reclaiming Kalakaua with Dr. Tiffany Ng, our guest today on Ukulele Songs of Hawaii. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. You. Ng. Thank you for being Aloha. Aloha.